Hello and welcome to the third part uh, of my tutorial about uh, logic in computer science with a strong bias towards automata. In this part, I will be talking about a variant of the model checking problem where we fix a formula and the algorithm inputs a model and tells you if the formula is true. I will mainly focus on models which are graphs, but uh, the general models uh, will, follow the will follow the same idea. The motivation behind uh, such uh, model checking problems is that many classical algorithmic problems can be just formalized using logical formulas. Well, in a certain sense, all of them, because uh, logic is the language of mathematics, but uh, the formalization uh, uses simple logic, such as first order logic, in many cases. Let's have a look at some examples. I will begin with uh, problems, algorithmic problems that can be formalized just in first order logic using the uh, uh, graph structure alone, so just the edges. So consider, for example, the clique problem, uh, where uh, we fix a size of the clique and we are asking if our graph contains a clique of size k. Uh, this can be easily written down in first order logic just by writing down the definition of a clique. You just say that there exist k edges which are uh, pairwise connected by, edge, by, by edges. Another example is a vertex cover of size k. You want to know if there exist uh, k vertices uh, such that every edge has at least one of its uh, endpoints uh, among these uh, k edges. So in, in these particular examples, uh, I fixed a k and then I uh, for each k I wrote a different formula. Later on, when I will move on to a more powerful logic, uh, namely monadic second order logic, I will I will be allowed to uh, skip the write a uniform formula which does not depend on k. But even if for uh, if uh, when the formula depends on k, there are interesting things to be said. So you could ask the following question. Maybe for first or for every first order sentence, there is a linear time algorithm which uh, recognizes graphs where phi is true. Now, the linear time algorithm is, is, is supposed to be linear in the graph, but uh, since the form of sentence is fixed, uh, then uh, it, uh, the, the, the multiplicative constant in the linear time uh, could be exponential in phi or it could be Ackermann or something. Uh, maybe let's just say it has to be computable. Now, uh, there is uh, an obvious polynomial time algorithm for every first order sentence. Uh, you just uh, evaluate it, so you you go uh, you replace the quantifiers by for loops. But the number of nested uh, for loops is the nesting of the quantifiers, and therefore the degree of the polynomial time depends on the formula phi. But the question is, can you drop this degree uh, to say linear or maybe quadratic, uh, but uh, a degree which is independent uh, of the formula phi, possibly at the cost of having a large multiplicative con constant. Now, there are some promising uh, 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 examples. So if you look at the vertex cover of size k, although it has, uh, well, k plus two uh, quantifiers, you can actually uh, solve it in uh, linear time without uh, having a polynomial that loops through all possible k plus two tuples. And uh, it, it, it is a classical uh, uh, algorithm in, in a field called fixed parameter tractability. I, I will not go over it, but the running time is um, exponential in the size of the uh, hypothetical vertex cover, but it is linear in the size of the graph. And uh, this is an example of a fixed parameter tractable algorithm where you have this parameter k, you're allowed to uh, behave exponentially or worse in the parameter, but in the main, uh, uh, in the input size, which is here the graph size, you're supposed to be linear or maybe quadratic, uh, uh, but in a way uh, we have polynomial that does not depend on the parameter k. Uh, so uh, maybe uh, uh, our hypothetical uh, uh, linear time uh, algorithm for every formula phi uh, does exist. Well, uh, the click problem uh, seems to be a hard instance. So it is uh, in the field of uh, fixed parameter tractability, it is conjectured that you cannot solve the clique in what is known as fixed parameter tractable time, uh, which means there is no algorithm which uh, runs in a, a time polynomial in the graph size with uh, multiplied by some uh, computable function uh, of the size of the uh, 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 clique that you are searching for. And therefore, since a clique uh, cannot be uh, can clique can be defined in first order logic, this conjecture says that uh, there is no uh, uh, that it would imply that there is no linear time algorithm that recognizes uh, every first order formula. Well, for uh, there is no uh, it is not the case that for every formula there is a linear time algorithm or a quadratic one for that matter. 
But nonetheless, uh, since you can express uh, many things in first order logic, it's, it's interesting to search uh, uh, for, for maybe special cases uh, where you can find linear time algorithm. Another logic that we can consider, and, and, and this is the one that has been uh, uh, receiving much attention in my tutorial so far, is monadic second order logic. In monadic second order logic, you can express uh, more, obviously uh, more problems. Uh, for example, uh, three colorability. So uh, you just write out the definition of three colorability in monadic second order logic. You say uh, there exist uh, three sets of vertices. I won't write the quantifiers because I'll probably make a mistake, uh, such that, well, uh, you just write out the definition of recolorability. So no edge has both endpoints in the same set, and uh, every vertex belongs uh, to uh, some set. And, 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 and therefore, uh, uh, you have here a, f a sentence of monadic uh, second-order logic such that the uh, graphs which uh, satisfy it form an uh, NP-complete set. And if you uh, if you think about uh, monadic second-order logic, uh, then um, the the obvious uh, algorithm for it is in the polynomial time hierarchy. Uh, if it has uh, uh, alternate uh, alternates uh, n times between existential and universal set quantifiers, you would expect it to be uh, on the nth level of the polynomial hierarchy, and, and nothing better is uh, is, is known. Uh, another example is a Hamiltonian path. So uh, uh, you can uh, uh, write just again the definition of a Hamiltonian path uh, as follows: You say there exists a set of edges. Now this is uh, I wanted to uh, to to, to uh, highlight this uh, to to point to the fact that it is important how you model a graph. Mm. Uh, I, I here I use the model which which I have used in the previous uh, lecture, where uh, the uh, underlying set of the structure contains both vertices and edges. And there is an incidence relation. And if you use this model, then you are allowed to quantify over sets of edges. So you can say there exists a set of edges, F, such that every vertex is incident to exactly two edges from uh, the set. And then you need to say that uh, this set forms a cycle uh, in the sense that it is uh, connected, which uh, you can express as follows. You say that um, you cannot uh, find a proper subset, uh, 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 well, which is a loop. So, uh, so for every proper subset, uh, some vertex is incident to exactly one edge from the proper subset. So you, you have to cut the cycle in, in some place. And in fact, if you use the, the model for graphs, where the underlying set is vertices and there's a binary relation for edges, then you could not define uh, Hamiltonian uh, cycles uh, because uh, well, this, this, this can be proved. So it, it is an important distinction. So, uh, and then you can, uh, in monadic second order logic, uh, you can really define uh, lots and lots of uh, classical al algorithmic uh, problems. Uh, and therefore, uh, it is interesting to ask, uh, is there maybe some generic algorithm which evaluates every proper uh, formula of logic uh, on, uh, on models? And, uh, well, uh, as I mentioned for clique, it, it is... Uh, uh, it, it is going to be a, a rather hard, but there exist important results uh, which say that this can be done if you limit the kind of graphs that you are looking at. So here's a nice example, which is uh, simple, and I will discuss it in more detail uh, later. It says that you can uh, do linear time model checking of first order logic for graphs of bounded degree. So it says that if you fix a first order sentence and you fix a bound on the maximal degree in a graph, having fixed those things, uh, you input a graph and you check if the sentence is, is true in the graph, but assuming that the graph has uh, the, the bound on the degree, then you can uh, solve this problem in linear time. Uh, now, uh, I will give you a, a, a proof later on. I'd just like to underline the fact that uh, the, the algorithm is linear in, ter in terms of the graph, but uh, the constants are uh, well exponential in the degree and uh, worse than exponential in, in, in the sentence of first order logic to, to, to be looked at. A corollary of this is that since you can formalize the uh, k-clique problem or the vertex uh, cover problem in first order logic, once k is fixed, it follows that for every uh, k and d, uh, fixed k and d, there is a linear time algorithm which uh, takes k, uh, k click or uh, k vertex uh, cover on graphs of degree at most d. Another example, and this is uh, the, the original uh, gangster of the series, is Coursel's uh, theorem, which says that uh, for every uh, uh, sentence, fixed sentence of monadic second order logic, 
And every parameter k, uh, the, uh, the model checking problem uh, for MSO can be solved in linear time on graphs of tree width uh, at most k. So, so this means that if you fix a bound on the tree width, uh, then you can check, uh, say, a linear uh, Hamiltonian path or three colorability or any other problem uh, formalizable monadic second order logic in linear time. Now, note that every graph has some to it, okay? So, in a sense, you have a family of linear time algorithms which uh, covers all uh, graphs. However, of course, the coefficients in these algorithms are quite bad. And uh, if uh, if you want to uh, check, say, a Hamiltonian path uh, on a very large uh, graph, it is not going to be a good idea to uh, use the uh, linear time algorithm for the parameter k, which is the graph size, because the, 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 the algorithm will be linear in the size of the graph, but uh, uh, far from linear in, in the parameter k. And uh, results such as uh, these two theorems are called algorithmic meta-theorems, because what they tell you is that they give you one big hammer, which allows you uh, to uh, 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 solve any kind of uh, uh, algorithmic problem that can be stated in logic, uh, well, on, 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 on inputs which satisfy the constraints in the, in the theorem. So in Cezas' theorem, it's going to be uh, uh, graphs of bounded degree, for uh, first order logic and in Kurser's theorem is going to be graphs of bounded uh, tree width. So let me begin maybe with uh, a, a more detailed look at Kurser's theorem. So uh, you can get Kurser's theorem immediately from the following two results. The first one is a theorem of uh, Bodlander, which tells you that you can uh, compute a uh, 3D compositions in linear time. So it says that for every fixed uh, k, uh, uh, you can uh, uh, solve in linear time the following problem. You're given a graph, and then you uh, uh, check if it if there is a 3D composition of, of width k, and if there is, you uh, output a, such a 3D composition. The, the 3D composition is not unique, so you output some 3D composition. Uh, uh, th this is a, a, a rather uh, uh, hard algorithm, and I will, will not have time to explain uh, in, in detail how it works. I just like to point out that there is a, is a prior algorithm in the Graph Miners project of Robertson and Seymour, uh, which is easier to understand. It would take I don't know, like a, a fifty minutes or something to explain it, uh, which is a little bit worse than. Uh, than, than the Bodlander algorithm because it is cubic. It doesn't compute a uh, 3D composition of optimal width, but uh, of, of, uh, of, of polynomially bigger width. But it is good enough uh, to prove a variant of uh, Kurser's theorem, where instead of a linear time, you have a cubic time. So as I said, I won't be going into a Bodlander's algorithm, uh, uh, which, which uses a uh, the, the 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 structure or theory of, of, of graphs, uh, but I will concentrate on on the, on the logical part of it, uh, uh, which allows us to infer uh, Kurser's theorem. And the logical part is kind of simple, and you've seen it in a, a, a in some form before, but I'll explain it in more detail now. It says that uh, for every uh, uh, fixed uh, bound on tree width an MSO sentence, you can do the following thing in linear time. You're given not just the graph, but you're given the tree decomposition, which is a tree. And then you want to know if the underlying uh, graph of the 3D composition satisfies a formula phi. Now, you can easily see that Bodlander's uh, theorem and this lemma uh, give uh, Kurser's theorem because, well, you just uh, uh, compute the 3D composition using Bodlander's theorem and then you check uh, using the lemma if the uh, underlying graph satisfies the uh, formula uh, phi. So uh, let's have a look at, at the lemma. Why is it true? Well, if you uh, uh, remember... Uh, from uh, the previous lectures, I mentioned that you can pull back uh, an MSO formula from uh, graphs uh, to uh, 3D compositions. So uh, the result, the, the, the dilemma, of the, the observation is that uh, for every k, uh, you can, uh, if you have a formula, uh, the black phi, which runs on the graphs, so it has access to vertices and, inc and edges on the incidence relation, uh, then uh, uh, in a graph, then you can pull it back to a formula, red phi, which uh, works directly on uh, tree decompositions 
of with k. So these are trees uh, uh, where every node has zero, one, or two children, uh, zero for the constants, one for the forget operations, and two for the merge operations. The trees are labeled because every node is labeled by the operation that it uses. And this formula, red phi, can uh, work directly in the in, in the tree which describes the tree decompositions, and it tells you if, if the black phi formula is going to be true in, in the graph. And this is because you can interpret uh, graph in its in its 3d composition so this is an observation that we made before and uh, once you have that uh, you are not far away from uh, evaluating uh, uh, mso in linear time uh, and the reason is that uh, it, uh, all you need to do now is you need to if you're given the 3d composition you need to evaluate the red phi formula and it, it remains to show that every uh, fixed mso formula on trees can be evaluated in linear time. So some, some function of the formula, which we're going to be, it's going to be a, a tower of exponentials uh, times the size of the tree. So if the formula is fixed, then the uh, evaluation algorithm is linear. And the reason why you can evaluate MSO uh, in linear time on trees is that uh, you can uh, compile it to automata. So uh, this is an, an old result which uh, goes back to uh, Thatcher and Wright in 1968, which says that for finite trees, MSO and tree automata define the same languages. So let me uh, maybe explain in more detail what a tree automaton is. Uh, it works as follows. So first of all, uh, I, I, I explain what I mean by a tree in more, more detail. So I, I, I consider trees which are over ranked alphabet. So that means that the input alphabet, uh, every letter has an arity. So for example, the letter A, it has arity two, which means every use of the letter A will have uh, two children. Uh, two children, the, the, the letter B has a, a arity uh, one, which means that every use uh, of letter B will have one child. And finally, letter C uh, has arity zero, which means it has to be a leaf. And uh, on such trees, you can uh, run a deterministic bottom-up automata. So this is one of one variant of tree automata. And the way it works, it just uh, assigns trees uh, beginning with the leaves and progressing towards the root. And once you have assigned states uh, to all of your children and you have label A, then you use a transition function delta sub A to uh, compute the new state uh, in, in your node. In the special case where A has arity zero, then uh, delta sub A is just a constant. It, it tells you what is the state to be used for, uh, for, for, for leaves with, with that particular label. And so uh, then you uh, apply this transition function and you get a state in every uh, leaf. And then you progress up the tree and eventually uh, you get a state in the root and then you check if it is accepted. This is a deterministic bottom-up automaton on finite trees. So in the first lecture, I discussed uh, uh, non-deterministic automaton on infinite trees. Those were far more complicated, but uh, deterministic bottom-up automata on finite trees are, are quite a simple object. And it is the one described here. And it is uh, rather uh, easy to see. It's, it's, it's very similar to, to classical. Well, this is what Thatcher and Wright proved, that languages recognized these, by these automata have all of the proper closure properties of MSO. So they're closed under union, which can be showed using a product construction complementation. Since these are deterministic, you just complement the accepting set and projection. So for projection, what, what one way you can do it is you can introduce non-deterministic bottom-up tree automata and uh, uh, then uh, show that they can be determinized, which they in fact can be. And, uh, and, and therefore we see that MSO is contained in tree automata and MSO uh, uh, and tree automata are contained in MSO in the same way as for finite words. Uh, and in fact, uh, the, 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 the proof, uh, the, this correspondence is, is just the same proof as for BHL, but Tratton brought for finite words, but you just have to uh, use tree automata on finite trees. As I mentioned before, uh, the Rabin theorem, which came uh, one, one year later, 1969, is, is, is a much more sophisticated uh, construction. Uh, since a deterministic bottom-up tree automata uh, can be evaluated in linear time, uh, then uh, it follows that every MSO formula can be evaluated in, in linear time because it is equivalent to some tree automaton, which can, which can also be uh, computed. And thus it follows that uh, there is a linear time algorithm for evaluating tree automata given a tree decomposition, which is just run the appropriate uh, tree automaton. And this completes the proof of Kursar's theorem. I'd like to point out that, that this, that there's a, there's a generalization, there are generalizations of, of this result to, to other tree measures than, than tree width, uh, uh, in particular, uh, rank width, 
which uh, uh, which is the same uh, no, no notion essentially as as, as click width, uh, which allows you to uh, capture uh, more trees in the sense that uh, uh, more uh, tree languages have bounded uh, tree rank width than bounded uh, tree width uh, at the cost of of uh, restricting MSO to a variant where you can only quantify oversets of vertices, but you're not allowed to quantify oversets of edges. Uh, the the rank width for click width, sorry, is, is quite interesting, but uh, uh, and has lots of interesting uh, technical results there as well. But I have no no no, no time to talk about it uh, in this tutorial. So that was Crusell's theorem. So we know that uh, you can, on bounded tree width, you can evaluate MSO, a very powerful logic in linear time, and, and, and therefore uh, for uh, large uh, hundreds of graph uh, algorithm graph problems, there exist uh, uh, linear time algorithms for uh, graphs of bounded tree width. Now let me have a, let's let, let's turn to the Cesse theorem and let me uh, discuss a little bit how you can uh, prove it and uh, what are the kinds of generalizations or follow up uh, work uh, in in this. Journey. So in the Cesse theorem, uh, the main proof is not going to be automata. We leave uh, the the automata world, but it is going to be something called locality and and, and specifically uh, Geithman's uh, theorem about locality of first order logic. Uh, so uh, let me begin by explaining what this locality is. Uh, so here is the Geithman theorem. It says that every sentence of first-order logic on graphs is equivalent to a Boolean combination of basic local sentences. So what's a basic local sentence? It's, uh, it looks like this. It says that there exist k vertices uh, uh, for some parameter k, uh, uh, such that uh, these uh, vertices are far from each other. So there's another parameter r called the radius, and you have to say that uh, they're, they're pairwise uh, distance from each other. And all of these vertices satisfy uh, some uh, fixed first order property. Uh, now, uh, it's, 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 it has to be, uh, it, it cannot be a, any first order property because uh, otherwise uh, uh, you would not be getting anything from this theorem, but it's, it's a property which is local. So what does it mean that the formula is local? It means that uh, whether or not the formula is true, this is a formula with one free variables, depends only on a, a local neighborhood of the vertex. So if you have a graph, then uh, the R neighborhood of a vertex, so here it's like big red vertex, is uh, the, the, the vertices which can be reached from uh, the, 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 the vertex uh, using at most uh, R edges. So here uh, I have a neighborhood of uh, radius uh, 2. And uh, a formula is called uh, R local if it depends only on the R neighborhood of uh, the vertex, which means with the, there's a semantic way of, of, of expressing it, which says that the formula is true in a vertex if and only if it uh, is true in the graph obtained by just keeping only the R neighborhood and deleting all the other uh, vertices from the graph. Uh, uh, syntactic characterization, which is equivalent, is saying that a formula is uh, R local if it is equivalent uh, to a new formula where, which is obtained by, by replacing every quantifier in a way that it quantifies only over vertices which are in, in, uh, in the R neighborhood of our central uh, vertex. And uh, this is uh, the, the syntactic exchange is easy to see to be uh, equivalent to the semantic one. And, and uh, uh, this completes the definition of our local formulas. So Geifman's theorem tells us that uh, for every uh, first order sentence, you can uh, just uh, evaluate it by looking at uh, uh, basic local sentences, and, and, and uh, there's a brilliant combination of those. Uh, a theorem is effective in the sense that, uh, given a sentence of first order logic, you can compute uh, the equivalent combination of basic local sentences. Uh, although uh, the, uh, the, the, the Boolean combination and the basic lo local sentences involved in it are going to be uh, rather large, uh, in fact, uh, non elementary, so towers of exponentials will be involved. Uh, so, Geithman's locality theorem is going to be the tool that is going to will be used uh, in Cesar's theorem and its generalization. So as I said, we're not going to be using automata, but locality. So let's prove uh, Cesar's theorem. Uh, thanks to Geithman's theorem, it is enough to show that we can evaluate in linear time uh, on graphs of bounded degree d uh, sentences which result from Geithman's theorem, so basic local sentences. 
Let us therefore fix a degree bound on the degree and a basic uh, local sentence, not such as the one uh, on the slide, and we will now give a linear time algorithm for evaluating it. Now, the main observation is that since phi of x depends only on uh, uh, vertices which are around x in a, a, a distance uh, at most r, uh, uh, and the degree of the graph is bounded, uh, therefore this uh, uh, neighborhood, r neighborhood of every vertex has constant size, and we can check if uh, 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 phi of x in constant time by just uh, uh, running the formula on a constant size, uh, uh, constant size uh, neighborhood. Uh, and, and therefore, we can, in linear time, we can compute uh, for every vertex whether or not it satisfies uh, phi of x. And this will be used to, uh, to uh, satisfy the basic uh, local sentence. It is not, uh, the, however, uh, uh, all we need. So if k would be 1, then it would be fine. We would just uh, search through all vertices and check if at least 1 satisfies phi of x. But uh, now what we need to find is k vertices, which are far from each other, and they, each one of them satisfies phi. So a naive algorithm uh, would be uh, to check, uh, go for every k tuple, but that would have a, a, be a, a polynomial of degree k. Uh, this, however, can be solved in linear time. And let me explain the idea uh, just for k equals 2. So uh, suppose that uh, the uh, uh, k is 2, so we're searching for two vertices which are far from each other, and both of them satisfy uh, phi. Uh, as I say, the naive algorithm is quadratic. Uh, for every pair, check if they're, 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 they're far away. But here's how you can do it in linear time. So let's uh, do a naive uh, greedy algorithm first. So for every uh, vertex, we, look, uh, we search for the first vertex which satisfies phi of uh, x. So, and let's uh, use this as our x1. And uh, uh, now we have fixed x1, and then now we uh, check uh, uh, for all other vertices uh, for x2, but they have to be far away from x1. So we search for vertices x2, which are a distance uh, greater than r from x1, and if we find one which also satisfies phi, then we're done, because we have found uh, two uh, vertices uh, which uh, both satisfy phi, and they're a distance uh, uh, greater than r. However, this uh, naive greedy algorithm uh, uh, can give a false negative because it, it could uh, uh, be the case that once you have fixed x1, you will not find any x2 which is far away from it and satisfy phi. But if you would have chosen a different x1, then you could have uh, uh, done this. So here's a picture. Suppose that uh, our greedy algorithm uh, uh, searched for a vertex x1 and the first one it found was, uh, uh, was, was this one, the one in, in red. Uh, and then it searches for uh, uh, another vertex x2, which is uh, far away from it and satisfies phi, but it doesn't find anything, so it says no. However, uh, uh, if you would have chosen uh, different vertices, namely uh, x1 and x2 in blue, uh, uh, then these are at the distance uh, uh, 4, and, and uh, if, say, is, is, is r is equal to, for example, uh, 2, uh, then uh, the, the, the Geifman basic local sentence is satisfied, but your algorithm would not find them uh, because uh, both the blue x1 and blue x2 were excluded uh, once we have fixed the red x1. So this is an example of how you can get a false negative in the algorithm. But if you uh, think about it, the only way you can get a false negative in, in the algorithm is if both the blue x1 and x blue x2 are close to uh, uh, the red x1. So in fact, uh, uh, the only way you can get a false negative is that the basic uh, local sentences is satisfied by some pair of vertices, uh, which is at a distance at most 2r, because, well, by the triangle inequality, from blue x1 to red x1, there is distance at most r. From red x1 to blue x2, there is distance at most r. And therefore, from blue x1 to blue x2, there is distance at most uh, 2r. Uh, and therefore, uh, false negatives uh, are, are witnessed by, uh, by the fact that there are two vertices which are close to each other, and uh, such pairs can be uh, found in linear time uh, in the bounded degree uh, graphs, because you just have to uh, inspect uh, neighborhoods of size at most 2R, 2R and, and these have constant size. Uh, this is how you solve it for k equals 2, and for k equals uh, 3 or bigger, you use a variation of the idea, so it's a, uh, it's a greedy algorithm augmented with uh, inspection of of larger neighborhoods than just R. Uh, but I won't give the details of, of that. You, you can uh, either figure it out yourself or, or look up the paper. Uh, so uh, this is Cesar's theorem. So on graphs of bounded, uh, for every bound on the degree, you can uh, evaluate sentences of first order logic in uh, linear time.
or, or, although the complexity of this algorithm is first of all there's the cost of uh, finding uh, uh, converting a formula to a Geifman uh, local uh, form uh, which is a uh, non-elementary and then or there's also the exponential uh, size uh, blow up when you look at uh, neighborhoods of some fixed uh, radius r and uh, now uh Cezanne's algorithm is just one of a family of uh, of, of of results of, of this type and, and and they go quite far and it's a it's a fascinating story and uh, let me describe to you uh, two important uh, ways in which uh, Cezanne's theorem can be generalized uh, so one of them says that you can do what Cezanne did uh, not only for graphs of bounded degree but for any class of graphs which uh, is, is sparse in a certain sense which is called uh, nowhere dense and I will describe it in a moment and then there is uh, another story, uh, which is a, a graph measure called twin width, which is uh, very recent. And uh, uh, I'd also like to uh, discuss that direction as well. So let me begin with nowhere dense uh, uh, classes. So uh, uh, consider the, uh, any of the following graph classes. Graphs of degree at most five. This is an example of a graph, uh, a graph class of bounded degree. Uh, uh, graphs of truth at most five. Uh, uh, this uh, a class of bounded truth. So by Cezanne's uh, theorem, you can evaluate first order logic on graphs of degree at most five in linear time. And uh, by uh, Courcelles' theorem, you can evaluate not only first order logic, but also monadic second order logic on graphs of truth at most five. You can also uh, evaluate uh, uh, first order logic on uh, planar graphs in linear time. Uh, and uh, you can do that as well uh, for. Uh, uh, graphs uh, that avoid, say, the five click as a graph minor, and uh, these are uh, these are these are all uh, uh, later results. So for all of these classes, each, each of these classes, uh, there is a linear time algorithm which uh, inputs a graph from the class and tells you if it, if, if, if the graph satisfies the formula phi. And, and as usual, uh, the, the linearity is in terms of the input graph, but not in terms of the formula. And uh, uh, there is actually a uniform, uh, uh, th these were all results that were proved separately, but there is a uniform explanation, which is uh, very beautiful, and which is uh, captured by the notion of a nowhere dense uh, graph class. So a nowhere uh, dense is a property of a class of graphs. So the, the, it's, a, it's a third order uh, notion because it is a set of uh, sets of uh, graphs. So what is a nowhere dense uh, class? So let me explain the definition at least. So let me define a nowhere dense, uh, nowhere denseness of a graph class. It's uh, the, the uh, consider a, a radius r. It's similar to the radius in Geifman uh, normal form, and uh, let's uh, uh, define a minor relation uh, which is uh, uh, parameterized by the radius. So let's have say I have a smaller graph h, and I have say a bigger graph g, and I say that h is um, r minor of the bigger graph G, if you can associate to each uh, vertex of H a subset of vertex is vertices in G. So here, uh, H has uh, four vertices, so I, I associated uh, four subsets of vertices in the following way. First of all, uh, all subsets are pairwise disjoint and they have radius R. So it means that for each subset, you can uh, pick a point in the subset uh, such that all other vertices in the subset are at distance at most R from, from the central point. And the second property is that you can recover the co if you simulate the vertices of H by the corresponding subsets in G, you can uh, you can recover the edges. So if you have two vertices in edge which are connected by an edge, then the corresponding subsets uh, are also connected by an edge. So in the example that I gave to you, you can see that in H, H is a clique, so every vertex is connected to each other. And if you look at the red subsets, uh, uh, in G, they also form a clique in the sense that for every two uh, uh, red subsets, you can find an edge uh, which has one point endpoint in one of the subsets and another endpoint in the other subset. So uh, this way, we have shown that the red subsets uh, demonstrate uh, the uh, graph H as a minus, and the radius R is well uh, the 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 radius of these uh, of all of these subsets is in this case one, because uh, for each uh, of the subsets you can find 
a uh, a vertex such that uh, all of the other vertices are a distance at most one. So here we have shown that the red example graph H is a one minor of G, but of course you could have a two minor, three minor, and so on. So the classical notion of graph minor is just an R minor for some R, but it turns out to be quite fruitful to uh, introduce this parameter. So here's the definition of nowhere denseness, which is due to Nesha Chila and Sonata Mendes. It says that a class of graphs C is nowhere dense if for radi every radius R, you cannot get all graphs as R minors. So as you increase the radius, you get more and more min minors. And uh, every minor uh, in the usual graph minor sense is an R minor for some R. Uh, but uh, what the definition says is that uh, you... Uh, uh, well, uh, at any finite stage of R, you will never get all graphs. So let's have a look at uh, at some examples. Uh, by the way, uh, we're just to 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 to, uh, to to make it clear, we're talking about finite graphs here. Uh, for example, uh, if you take a graph, a class of graphs which has bounded degree, then it is nowhere dense. And why is that? Because if you take an R minor of a graph which has degree at most d. Uh, then uh, it's easy to see that uh, the, the minor will have degree at most d to the power of r plus 1 because uh, the, the vertices will be uh, balls of radius r and uh, uh, such a ball of radius r can have at most r plus 1 uh, adjacent vertices. Uh, and, and therefore, uh, uh, when the uh, uh, radius r of the minor is fixed, you will only get graphs of bounded degree and, and therefore you will not get, for example, a, a large cliques. Example two, suppose that a class has bounded truth, then it also is nowhere dense. And, and, and here the reason is follows. Uh, it is, uh, if you take a graph of, say, of truth k, uh, then it cannot have a k plus one clique, uh, and also there's, the grids are another example, but let's stay with cliques. It cannot have a k plus one clique as a minor for any r. So, uh, in fact, uh, here there's a stronger property, which is that uh, there is exists a, a, a graph which cannot be obtained a, 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 as a minor for, for, for all R. In other words, it's an excluded uh, minor class. And so every excluded minor class is going to be nowhere dense. So, uh, uh, nowhere dense class classes, uh, graph classes, uh, include uh, uh, bounded tree width, they include bounded degree. Uh, they also include uh, uh, or bounded uh, excluded minor cl classes, uh, such as uh, planar graphs, uh, for example. And, and therefore, all of the uh, graph classes which are listed here uh, are, are examples of nowhere dense classes. Now let's see how we can leverage the fact that uh, class is uh, nowhere dense. Well, here's an important result, uh, which says that if a class of graphs is uh, nowhere dense, then model checking for every fixed formula, uh, a first order formula, is linear time, almost linear time. So it says that if you have a nowhere dense uh, graph uh, class, then for a first, every first order sentence, uh, the model checking problem can be solved in, well, it's not exactly linear time, but it's n to the power of 1 plus epsilon for an epsilon, which can be made arbitrarily small. So this is a, a, um, I, I will not have time to uh, uh, discuss uh, the proof of this uh, uh, theorem, uh, uh, but uh, I just want to uh, mention that it, uh, it it uses, well, apart from the Geifman theorem, of course, it uses uh, the, uh, the, the, the theory of nowhere dense uh, graph classes, which is, is very well developed uh, initially by uh, Neshet Shila and Osona de Mendes, who proved uh, uh, many uh, equivalent characterizations and one of the uh, important uh, notions that appears there is uh, uh, tree depth. So uh, it, it turns out that there's a connection between nowhere denseness and, and tree depth, which is a, and tree depth is a, is a notion that is connected. Well, it's similar to tree width, but uh, slightly different. All I want to say is that this is a fascinating story, and I, 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 uh, I encourage you to have a look at, 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 at these results if, 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 if you have time. The result is optimal. Uh, in the sense that if you take a class which is not nowhere dense, then model checking is hard. So here I assume uh, that uh, the class is closed under subgraphs. Uh, now, uh, the, the, and by subgraphs I mean uh, not induced subgraphs, but uh, uh, graphs which can be obtained by eliminating vertices and or edges. Uh, 
Uh, note that if a class is nowhere dense, then if you close it under subgraphs, then it continues to be nowhere dense. So the Grohe, Kreutzer, uh, and Siebert's algorithm, it, it, it works. Uh, uh, the, the interesting case is cl uh, cl uh, classes which are closed under uh, subgraphs. Uh, and uh, let me observe now that if a class is uh, closed under subgraphs and it is not nowhere dense, uh, then model checking is going to be hard. So why is that? Well, suppose that a class is not nowhere dense and closed under subclass. Then if you unfold the definition of uh, being uh, uh, not nowhere dense, it means that there is some radius r, uh, uh, there's some radius where you can get all uh, graphs as minors uh, using that radius. And then uh, you can show that uh, the following is, well, almost true. It's not uh, literally true uh, uh, to, to, to make it true. You have to have a, a slightly more uh, technical definition, but uh, it is uh, true enough uh, so that you can get the picture. Uh, uh, the following is almost true, that for every graph, you can see its R subdivision uh, as, a, as an element of the class C. And an R subdivision of a graph is a graph which is obtained by replacing uh, uh, paths, uh, 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 edges by paths of, of length R. And as I said, it's not literally true, but it's, uh, 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 it is close enough. And uh, if you have a class which contains R subdivisions, uh, say five subdivisions of all graphs, uh, uh, then uh, the model checking for that uh, uh, graph class is going to be as hard as, 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 the, as the, the model checking problem for all graphs because you can uh, use first order logic to, 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 to replace uh, paths of length five with, with edges and, and, and then you can simulate every graph in, in that class. Uh, so uh, this is just a proof sketch, but uh, it's, it's not hard to get the, the actual proof, uh, which says that if a class is not nowhere dense and closed under subgraphs, then model checking is hard. So uh, for graph classes, we know exactly when a model checking is uh, 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 can be done efficiently for a fixed formula. If the class graph uh, graph class is nowhere dense, then it is almost linear, and uh, the, 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 there's a dichotomy. So otherwise, if it is not nowhere dense, uh, then it is as hard as, as the general problem, and then therefore conjectured uh, to be impossible to do with a polynomial of fixed degree. This is all under the assumption that we're working with uh, graphs, uh, classes closed under sub which is actually going to be uh, uh, an important, uh, uh, which is going to be the motivation uh, for the next uh, and last topic uh, of my tutorial, which is twin width. Uh, so, uh, uh, first order logic, as I uh, is, 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 is is linear time uh, on some uh, graph classes, which uh, have which are not nowhere dense, uh, but they're not closed under subgraphs. Here's some examples. Suppose that you take uh, planar graphs and then you complement them in the sense that uh, for every uh, edge you replace it by a non-edge and for every non-edge you replace it by an edge. So you just, uh, in terms of first order logic, instead of edge, you, uh, you, you take the negation of edges. Now, since uh, a complement uh, uh, for first order logic, uh, it doesn't matter if, there is an, uh, uh, if you have to write edge or you have to write non-edge, then uh, complements of, of planar graphs are just as hard as planar graphs, and planar graphs are uh, nowhere dense. Uh, another example is you can take complements of graphs of three to the most five, or, or just uh, uh, generally any. Uh, you take any class, uh, say nowhere dense. You take the complements uh, of those graphs, and then you will get a, a, a class of graphs uh, which has uh, uh, linear time or, or, or almost linear time model checking, and. Uh, Mm. These uh, graph classes are not closed under uh, subgraphs. Well, the, the, the examples of complements are closed under adding vertices. Uh, uh, they're closed under uh, adding edges, uh, but uh, they're not closed under subgraphs. Uh, another example is if you're familiar with click width, then you take uh, any class of graphs of bounded click width, and then uh, uh, even MSO, as long as you're not allowed to quantify over sets of uh, edges, only sets of vertices, any such uh, uh, class of bounded click width is going to have uh, uh, first, uh, first order and even MSO model checking in linear time. Uh, so these are uh, classes uh, uh, which are not nowhere dense, but they're not closed under subgraphs. And it would be nice to have a theory which explains uh, why model checking is efficient for uh, uh, such a graph classes. Well, the first two examples you could say is just a nowhere dense hiding behind complement, but uh, click width is not like that. And then you can 
the uh, hide the complement even further so that it's a, it's, a, it's a, no, no, not clearly visible and it, it would be nice to have a theory which explains this and there is a, a, a recent development in in, 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 in group graph theory and, and, and logical applications which uh, which can be seen as giving a uniform explanation of, of some of these uh, for all of these graph classes which is something called a bounded twin width so let me explain what this is uh, consider a graph and a partition with a partition of its vertices into some blocks. So, say here we have partitioned uh, uh, the, the the graph itself has uh, eight vertices, and we partitioned them into three blocks A, B, C. And I would say that uh, two blocks uh, are consistent if they are connected in the same way. So, what does that mean? So, for example, blocks A and B are consistent be because for every vertex from A and for every vertex from B, there is an edge between them. So, it doesn't uh, matter which vertex you choose from A, which vertex you choose from B, there is always going to be an edge. And, uh, well, dually, uh, blocks B and C are also consistent uh, because uh, there is, uh, for every vertex uh, pair, one from B, one from C, there is a non-edge between them. On the other hand, uh, blocks A and C are inconsistent because uh, sometimes there is an edge and sometimes there's not an edge. It depends on how you choose a vertex from A and how you choose a vertex uh, from C. So this is uh, this this notion can be used uh, to define twin width as follows. It's a notion which was a, a, it's a very recent notion as you can see. Uh, a graph has a twin width uh, k and k is is a number. It's like for tree width. If uh, you can uh, find a sequence of partitions uh, on its vertices with the following property. So first of all, you start out with the trivial partition where every vertex is its own uh, in its own block, and then you end up. In, in the partition where uh, everybody is uh, is together. And then when you go uh, uh, from uh, the one partition to the next one, you just merge two blocks. And uh, uh, the most important property is that at any given moment, when you have a partition, uh, for every block, there is a constant number, well, k, uh, uh, blocks which are inconsistent with it. So uh, if you look at the inconsistency graph, then it has a degree at most uh, k. So the idea is that you, well, in the first stage, uh, P1, it is uh, uh, the where the blocks are, are, are trivial, then it's going to be uh, consistent for uh, uh, trivial reasons. And then, uh, but as you start uh, emerging vertices, uh, you could uh, uh, create uh, uh, some inconsistencies are, as a result of that, uh, but uh, what, what you uh, what you have to have, uh, what you need to keep is that at any given moment there is a, a bounded number of inconsistencies uh, for every every block, and uh, this is the notion of uh, twin width. So let's have a look at some examples. First, let's look at cliques. I claim that every clique width has twin width zero. So why is that? Well, here's a clique, say a six clique. And uh, let's give a, a, a twin with decomposition. It's going to be quite trivial. Uh, so uh, I begin, as I have to, with every uh, vertex being its own partition. And uh, there are no inconsistencies here because, well, uh, you cannot have inconsistencies, inconsistencies in every block at size one. But then I join the first two uh, uh, blocks. Now, since it's a clique, uh, so every two subsets are going to be completely uh, consistent, uh, are, are going to be consistent, uh, and, and therefore there are zero inconsistencies here, and there, in particular, every block is, is inconsistent with zero other blocks. And therefore, I can just keep on joining from left to right, or the vertices, and, and, and this way I see that the, the clique has twin with uh, zero. Uh, note that, for example, uh, I could uh, remove, for example, one edge uh, uh, from the, the creek, and it would have a twin with one because there would be at most one uh, inconsistency uh, it, uh, between blocks uh, along the, uh, at every step along the way. Another observation is that uh, if a graph has a twin with k, then if you take the complement of the graph, so you replace edges by uh, non-edges and, and vice versa, uh, then you uh, the same uh, sequence of partitions will have the same kinds of inconsistencies, and, and therefore it will be also a, a witness uh, for a twin with k. So it, it, it's, it's a measure of graph that's uh, stable under uh, taking complements, and as I've uh, observed before, it's also well stable under uh, removing individual edges by, by, by stable. I mean, that it's, uh, mm, uh, it does not change too much. And uh, what he act actually can prove this was uh, is that uh, uh, this is uh, uh, stronger than clique width in the sense that uh, 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 
uh, having uh, uh, the, the three measures uh, that I have uh, discussed in this uh, in this talk were uh, tree width and twin width. I, I defined click width. I only mentioned in passing. They are related by implications in the sense that it, uh, bounded tree implies click width, and, and the witness for the difference is is is, is, is say click clicks, uh, and then bounded uh, click width. It implies a bounded uh, twin width, and uh, because you can, it's it's not so hard to replace a, a click with decomposition if you know by it by uh, a, a twin width uh, decomposition of, of 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 similar width. And again, the implication is, is strict because, for example, the class of all uh, planar graphs has a bounded uh, twin width, uh, namely I think four or or three, uh, and and planar graphs uh, can have a unboundedly high uh, click width. So, uh, uh, in this sense, a twin width is a far-reaching uh, generalization of, 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 of tree width and, and clean tree width. And a, a, a new result uh, that, uh, that that was proved well together with twin width says that the first order uh, uh, model checking is is, 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 is is linear time on graphs of uh, bounded twin width. So if you're given a, a graph, uh, but importantly here uh, you need to uh, be given uh, uh, the, uh, the witness for uh, the uh, tree, uh, with small twin width, so the decomposition, which is the witnessing sequence of partitions. But if you're given a graph together. Uh, with a witnessing sequence of partitions, then you can evaluate a, a, a first-order formula in, in linear time uh, using, a, well, Geifman-like techniques. But of course, uh, you need to understand twin width quite well for that. Uh, it would be nice uh, to have, uh, say, a linear or maybe cubic uh, algorithm which would compute the witnessing sequence of partitions, so something like the Bodlander theorem theorem uh, for bounded uh, twin width. Uh, but as far as I know, this has not been uh, achieved yet. Uh, and and here we have uh, so so summing up there exist uh, uh, many restrictions on, on graph classes which ensure that the first order uh, can be uh, load formula fixed first order formulas can be evaluated efficiently and in, in most cases it's actually uh, linear or almost uh, linear time so the examples i gave are nowhere that's in twin width maybe it's, i worth like to point out that these two are incomparable so uh, well clicks uh, have bounded twin width twin width and, and are not nowhere dense but uh, conversely uh, 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 for example, uh, uh, bounded degree uh, uh, graph, uh, uh, bounded degree does not apply uh, bounded uh, twin width. And uh, this uh, sums up uh, uh, this part of the uh, of my talk, uh, which is actually the last part, uh, uh, which says that for uh, you can evaluate first order logic uh, efficiently. And uh, 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 and so we come to the end of my talk about uh, algorithmic uh, meta theorems, which say that any uh, algorithmic problem that you can formalize in logic, you can solve it uh, uh, efficiently. Well, assuming that the logic is right and the class of models uh, or, or graphs that you care about is right. And uh, so uh, uh, we come to the end of the entire tutorial, and uh, I hope that it has been a bit useful for for you. Uh, thank you very much.